I'm here in Europe with uh, a researcher whose work I've, I've come across and I've, I've been fascinated with a few of the ideas that he's, he's, he's put forth. Uh, welcome, Omar Khattab. Hey, Jay. Nice to be here with you. Great to have you. So, two things that came on my radar that you've worked on. I'm sure there's a lot, uh, a lot uh, of other things that you want to sort of focus on, but Colbert or Colbert, uh, possibly, and uh, DSPy. Like, I, I'd love to hear from you about these two sort of ideas, how you explain them to people. We can possibly start with, with, with Colbert, for example. And, sure. you know, assume that I know what a text embedding is, and I'm used to this semantic search by embedding a piece of text and then doing nearest neighbor search. How does Colbert think about that? And what are the trade-offs that you think between these two types of doing semantic search? So Colbert is a retrieval paradigm where, you know, you have a large corpus and you'd like to search it. And as you said, the most common approach here is working with text embeddings. You have a model, some variant of BERT usually, or it could be a GPT model, consumes your documents and gives you a dense representation, a vector, that you are going to search by embedding your query and then doing a retrieval. Now, Colbert comes with, based on the following uh, hypothesis, it basically asserts that Cramming the document representation, which could be, you know, a couple hundred words, could be longer than that in, in, in principle, um, into a single dense vector or, or a sparse vector um, is really bad for quality because you're asking that encoder to find this one representation that will be close to any potential question you could ask about, you know, hundreds of words in your document. So what Colbert does is it introduces this notion of late interaction, which is a different approach to retrieval. Basically, Colbert will encode documents at the level of tokens. So we'll actually have one vector for each word in your uh, document and same for queries. But these vectors are going to be extremely small and highly compressed, like 20 bytes per vector, for example. And in order to conduct search, it's actually going to be matrix uh, uh, operation, not a vector operation. And what that allows it to do is now all what Colbert needs to do is figure out a way to learn good representations for terms in their context, as opposed to asking the encoder to learn representations at the level of the entire sequence. And what we see in practice is that this leads to very large quality gains. Um, and then we've built a lot of uh, infrastructure over the years that make this you know, as efficient and as fast and as lightweight as searching uh, with single vector representations. What's a good way to sort of do um, uh, Colbert with the existing tooling, I guess. So th these are two questions. The first is like the intuition of why it works. And I think here it helps to think of cross encoders if people are familiar with them. What makes cross encoders really powerful is you have a language model and you go to the language model and you say, here's my query and here's my one document. I want you to run all the attention that you have in order to give me a relevance score that tells me, you know, how good is this document for my query? When we do this late interaction you know, mechanism in Colbert, we're essentially uh, doing some level of rough approximation of, of that attention by matching uh, at the token level. Now, in terms of how this scales, it's actually not that different internally from uh, putting these things into a vector database. It's just that you need to have that vector database recognize that you're working with matrices, not vectors, or really you're working with bags of vectors or sets of vectors. And the same type of scaling that you get from a good vector database or you know, a good um, uh, dense similarity index is, is what, 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 what Colbert leverages. So the general intuition here is that because it's built on summations of maximum similarities, these operators lend themselves very nicely to um, uh, scaling up with sublinear complexity. So if you have um, you know, a, a million documents, um, Colbert will not score them um, by looking at every single document. It will actually eliminate uh, the vast majority of these documents very quickly um, through a pruning, a pruning strategy. Can you introduce DSPy and how you think about it? Right, so the, I would say the, the mainstream or common way of thinking of language models is to think of them as these powerful user-facing systems, to think of them as these systems. So we want them to be able to chat with us, we want them to be able to reason, to do math, to, 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 um, to use tools, etc. And DSPy takes a different approach where we say um, it's actually better to think of language models as tools themselves or to think of them as almost like devices. 
and to switch from a mental mode of prompting where you're sort of trying to um, you know, coerce a language model into following your instructions into a mode of programming with much better defined primitives. So when we're talking about programming, it's helpful to think of language models as a device. And so you know, you're writing code, you have a CPU, you have a GPU, and you have a language model. Um, and these language models are now interchangeable to some extent, like, you know, bigger models do better, etc. cetera. But um, the, the key element in your focus is um, on the program structure as a whole. What is the information flow like? What, what, what are the steps that exist in, uh, in your system as you're building it? Um, and the idea there is we can benefit a lot as uh, researchers, as engineers, as everyone who's interested in this space, uh, from uh, building an, an analogy to the way um, deep neural networks have been uh, developed and the consensus that kind of generally emerged around those, where we have these layers, right? You could have, um, you know, convolution layers, attention layers, um, you know, recurrent layers, etc. Similarly here, prompting techniques that are emerging all over the place can be treated as modules or layers that are reusable. So now in DSPy, we have a layer called uh, chain of thought and another one called program of thought. React is another one. And uh, the idea is that in your program, you can um, declare the modules or the layers that you have and assign each of them a natural language signature. So you could say, um, I want to do a fancy version of RAG where I want a module, a chain of thought module that takes my, the user's question and gives me a search query. And all you express is the actual like signature that it takes a question and gives me a search query, and it's a chain of thought module. Um, and then maybe another module could be a program of thought uh, module, which says, I want to take the question from the user and the retrieved documents uh, from a search engine, and I want it to output maybe a final answer. Um, by nature of the program of thought uh, module, it will actually execute code internally. And then you structure these things in your program by calling these modules in your, in your code, in your computational graph, very similar to how you would construct a neural network in, in something like PyTorch. And then uh, once you've built this, you want to think of this as something uh, not as a, a, an artifact where you're going to sit down and, and manually engineer a, a prompt or manually engineer uh, a set of fine-tuned uh, weights and collect data for them. Instead, you want to think of this as um, a program that you can optimize. So you're going to come up with a meaningful metric that um, uh, is sort of automated. And you will pick one of the built-in optimizers in DSPy and say, here's my program, here is my metric. You know, please optimize the parameters of all of these modules that I have so, uh, so as to maximize the quality. And so um, you know, a, a chain of thought module in DSPy, if you're working with, let's say, one of Cohere's models, could learn um, how to uh, build its own high-quality instructions to maximize your metrics for your pipeline. Uh, maybe a smaller model needs more than instructions. It needs few-shot demonstrations. You don't have the time to sit down and sort of like work on finding and generating the best you know, uh, few-shot examples there yourself. The program, uh, with the help of the compiler, can bootstrap those, can generate those from scratch, uh, you know, and maximize the quality as evaluated uh, with a metric based on that. Um, what's really cool about this is that a lot of things that look very distinct to people, like, for example, um, prompting and fine-tuning, are actually one and the same in DSPy. These optimizers, they're ultimately, you know, bootstrapping or creating these demonstrations of all of the modules in your system. Uh, internally, there are optimizers that can work by fine tuning. So the same, you write a piece of code that's 20 lines, no hand written prompts, no hand labeling of all the stages of your, of your pipeline, which might be changing over time as you're exploring you know, new system designs. Um, and instead, um, through bootstrapping, you can uh, um, um, you know, basically ask it to work by fine tuning or prompting or otherwise. And what we've reported and what we've seen is that um, this actually allows very small models, like T5 large models with less than 1 billion parameters, um, to achieve really high quality on a, a wide range of tasks. And you know, there's no magic here. The whole point is that a good programming abstraction um, allows us to leverage these language models as these you know, powerful devices that they are, as opposed to these end-to-end -end systems um, that are you know, not super reliable as they, as, as they are right now. Where is DSPy now? So it's on, it's on GitHub. I think it's up like 4,000 stars or something. But where do you see it going? Where is it sort of, uh, where, where would you like to take it in the, in the new year? 
I view DSPy as a hopeful paradigm shift for the way we build AI systems. That's why I'm not really too in the weeds, although that's where the work is happening, on like the, the way a specific optimizer works or the way a particular module uh, you know, uh, is added or, or such. I really care about the idea that we want to use language models as these devices, and this is going to happen through you know, careful pro program uh, construction, careful problem decomposition, um, and an emphasis over automatic uh, compilation, as we, see, as, we, as, we, as we call it. So all of these powerful prompting techniques that are emerging, and I know a lot of people are cynical about them, in including myself sometimes, um, they should not be something that we sit down and, and sort of um, a hand engineer. This is, uh, this is a large search space that we can um, automatically explore through you know, uh, uh, systematic and, and um, modular, modular procedures. So the way I see uh, DSPy uh, you know, um, uh, evolving is I, I take a lot of inspiration from PyTorch. Um, we actually, you know, very explicitly borrow a lot of the design decisions that they made. Um, and, you know, we, you know, I, I, I joke about whenever I'm not sure sort of how, what sort of decision to make. For example, there was this decision of like, should DSPy um, disallow running out of prompt space? And then I thought, does PyTorch disallow running out of RAM on your GPU? And the answer is like, no, if you shoot yourself in the foot, it will, that might crash. Um, so the same happens in, in, in DSPy. And so I, I view this as, uh, you know, just the start of building what we call language model programs or these networks um, of large language model calls and the evolution of new optimizers, maybe based on RL, maybe based on other things. Um, this week, we um, have, you know, some really cool um, things, that, you know, we we're planning to release. We actually merged most of them in the repo already. You could already use them. We just haven't announced them. Um, so maybe I'll maybe you know since there are other folks on the projects, I'm not going to uh, you know say what they are, um, but we're very excited about a lot of the stuff that's that's coming soon. Incredible. So you'll be, you'll be presenting uh, DSPy as as part of the. What else do you look forward to in, in NURBS? What, what excites you? What themes are you on the lookout for? Well, I I, I definitely made sure to stop by a few of like the um, uh, papers that you know are extending things relating to Colbert some really cool work here from various places. Um, I also made sure to stop by uh, paper, you know, posters on uh, building these language model pipelines, you know, with multiple steps and careful decomposition. Um, and so I'm excited to see that this is kind of starting um, to, um, to, to become more and more mainstream. I'd say um, more powerful language models are extremely important. They are what facilitates all of this, um, but uh, a lot of the things we care about, a lot of the trustworthiness that we need, a lot of the, you know, reliability, the control, the uh, properties that we need from a user-facing AI system is only going to come um, from, uh, you know, a programming-oriented uh, approach, not from a, um, you know, a single monolithic um, uh, individual model.